we've not had those same conversations. We've not touched base with those agents or those clubs regarding the players. So uh, last night into this morning has been a lot of reconnecting and, and determining whose situation may or may not have changed with the, the agreement yesterday and, and what the situation is moving forward. So uh, it's been a lot of catch up. You know, I, I won't say that uh, our position hasn't changed. And, and for the most part you know, around the league, everybody is roughly picking up as if it were December 1st. Uh, next question, Corey Brock. Hi, Jerry. Um, while I assume your your wish list, your needs, and all whoops, all that have not changed since we last talked in December, I'm sort of fascinated by with the passage of time. Has your view on some players changed over that period of time, for better, for worse? Um, Maybe the players you were excited about on December 11th, you're, you've cooled your jets on by March 11th, if that makes sense. Or maybe vice versa, maybe you're a little bit more engaged or excited. But what has this passage of time done um, in, in terms of how you're looking at guys? It really hasn't changed our view of any player externally, you know, whether they be free agents or trade targets. You know, we have, I don't want to say eliminated trade targets, but we have adjusted some of our, our targets based on what we've seen over the this offseason and particularly over these last three weeks with some of our young players. And, you know, what we think is a fairly prepared young group of, of starting pitchers. And, you know, George Kirby and Levi Stout and Brandon Williamson. And what we know is true of Matt Brash. And, 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 and there are more and dripping into the bullpen. We feel like we have a lot of young pitching that can contribute sooner than later, which, which likely results in us focusing on mid-rotation to, to higher-end starters if we're going to do anything in our starting rotation. But, you know, we're, we're probably not inclined to focus on adding a back-of-the-rotation starter. We also would like to add, you know, a multifunction pitcher who gives us the ability to step in, start major league games, but is functional in a bullpen role as well so that we can, you know, manage the, the ascension of those guys that I just man mentioned when it's their time. And outside of that, there's really been no change. You know, we still are very focused, you know, plan A and B is, is improving our offensive efficiency and run scoring. And, you know, those are the, the first phone calls we made outgoing last night and this morning is to, to re-engage with those, those players or those teams. And next question, Ryan Divish. Jerry, I got two. Are you going to trademark ready to transact this morning? And also, um, what's the health status for your guys, Kyle Lewis, Evan White? Any limitations for them when they come in or what have you heard? You know, the, what we've seen so far is mostly just what you've seen, you know, as social media posts and, and the like. We've not seen anybody live yet. We did have a, a chance last night via conversation or text from coaches, from trainers, from, from, uh, from, from Jack Mossman, just connecting with the players. We think everybody's coming in healthy. We don't have, you know, uh, we don't have anybody coming in who we feel like is restricted from the start. We don't have a great feel yet for where, say, Justin Dunn is, who was, who was injured at the end of last season. And, you know, we've gotten positive reports, but we won't know until we see for certain. We're really excited about where Kyle Lewis is right now, just based on the feedback he's provided, what we learned from, from his rehab professionals, and what we've seen uh, on video of his, of his baseball workouts. He appears to be full go and, and ready to play. And, you know, the guys in general that were, I think the fact that we're young and athletic probably put us in an advantageous position here. And, you know, we, we seem to be coming in healthy and, and ready to go. And yes, I am ready to transact. I'm all for it. All right, next question, Tim Booth. Hey, Jerry, um, specifically, what, <clears throat> what do you feel like you need to add offensively right now? And, and, does the condensed time frame of all of this happening make it more difficult at all to do that via trade versus via free agency? Um, is, is there one way that's going to be easier to, to essentially get that done? You know, to, to the last question, I don't know. I, to, to be honest with you, this is the first time any of us have ever, you know, done what we're doing right now 
in spring training with you know an open field with with multiple hundred free agents available and and trade discussions happening that that started before the the lockout but now pick up in earnest uh, I don't know how hard it's going to be to be honest with you or what the timeline is going to be you know I suspect that uh, there's going to be a host of free agents who would like to sign and get into camps and and that there are teams that want to determine what their roster is going to look like so you know does that expedite matters? I don't. I don't know the answer, but you know we're ready to, to move at the pace that the market moves. And to to the question of what we plan on doing, same thing we we plan on doing in, in October, November, December is you know we'd like to add. We, we added Adam Frazier, who gives us a a, a really nice contact oriented on base veteran professional hitter that makes us a better team. You know, we feel like with the improvements we're likely to see or believe we'll see from a lot of our young players and then contributions that are made from young players who haven't made it yet, but will. Uh, that's exciting. We want to we want to add some impact to our offense and, you know, believe that minimally we want to go get one impact bat. you know, whether that's free agent or or trade remains to be seen. And if we can manage to swing both, we'd like to get two. And, and uh, you know, they're likely to play on the left side of our field. Some combination of third base, left field, DH is uh, what we're looking for. Ideally, we could find someone who can, you know, help with center field. But what we're seeing from Kyle Lewis, the work that I know Jared Kelnick did this offseason, and the potential for Julio Rodriguez, even, you know, playing some center field for us, are all real possibilities so that lessens, you know, the dynamic need for, for a center fielder or the immediate need. Next question, Mari Brown. All right, all right. You mentioned about the market moving and how it's been compressed, certainly heading in to the lockout and now coming out. Um, is payroll flexibility there? I mean, I, I could see things, you know, ramping up pretty fast and having negotiations move more quickly, which may require more flexibility around payroll. Um, how are you set up for that? Uh, same as we were set up prior to the, the, the downtime. You know, I, I think with what we've already done, you know, by adding Robbie Ray, by adding Adam Frazier and, and what we were at least tethered to in the, in the court of, of rumor, we, we've been very active at the, at the top end of, of the free agent market. And, and we've been very active in checking in with established veteran players that, that might be available via trade. So uh, we, we have uh, committed to adding payroll to our roster. We had the, the flexibility to do it. And frankly, we've already done some of that and, and don't intend to stop. So if the, if, if the players line up, we have the, the flexibility to add them, you know, it takes two to tango. We have to find the right player or the right trade match, but we do have the, the financial flexibility. Next question, Shannon Dreher. Jerry, with a shorter spring training, fewer games, what challenges does that present that you normally wouldn't be facing in, in getting a team ready for a season? Mostly it's about ramping up the pitcher's innings and, you know, and allowing the players to, to start integrating at a pace that doesn't create a higher threat for injury. And, we, we feel like some of that back in the summer of 2020, we learned some lessons uh, about how to, to do that. We, as most of you have been aware, have been on the more conservative end in, in our league for how we've, we've managed pitcher innings, prospect pitcher innings, you know, anything from a six man rotation to, uh, to shorter starts, et cetera. We're gonna be conscious of all that. And, you know, in, in a typical you know, spring training, we're able to get our, our pitchers up to that 100 pitch mark. That might be more challenging in, in this go around. You know, and if that's the case, we're just going to be conscious of carrying added innings in our bullpen where we can augment that and, and not put uh, anybody at risk. And I think the position players, as is always the case, as most of them will tell you, that they'll come in ready to play. We just need to make sure we we take it easy on their feet the first week, so to speak, and, you know, make it short outings, uh, you know, three, four, five inning games. And, and then the last 10 days, two weeks of spring training, you'll see them play regularly. And they're almost always ready uh, a week or 10 days before we break anyway. So I don't think the position player group will be affected in any major way. Next question, Curtis Crabtree. 
Yeah, Jerry, what's what's kind of your thoughts on some of the structural changes to the game that we've seen through the CBA, whether it's, I mean, it doesn't affect you guys, but the universal DH, some of the structures to the young players and the incentives to bring them up earlier and playing it. What, 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 what stood out to you on that front? What piqued your interest and what, what, what do you like most about some of the tweaks that have been made? I, mean, I, I think across the board, you know, the, the deal that was reached yesterday, it's just good for baseball. It's good that we have baseball back. I do think that, th that we have gone a long way toward, uh, toward taking care of the young players. And I, and I admire the Players Association for, for taking the stance that they did. And, and I'm, I'm happy that we as a league, you know, improved the, the, the financial or economic uh, situation for the young guys in our league. I'm most intrigued by some of the rule changes that are probably a year out. Uh, I'm maybe as happy uh, about the idea of, of the, the ban on shift that it's just going to make it a more interesting game to watch than, than baseball has sometimes become over the last few years and, you know, make the game move quicker. And, and that's, that's an exciting thing. I love pitch clock. You know, we've watched it in the minor leagues for quite some time. All of our young pitchers are in tune with it. And it, it truly makes the game easier to watch in a lot of ways. And, you know, we all love watching the game, but to, to see a crisp, clean, athletic looking game is that's what baseball has always been. And, and we got away from that a little bit. So I, I think the, the rules changes that are on the, the horizon are exciting in that way. And, uh, and I guess, fingers crossed, whenever it comes down the road, the international draft is something we all have to prepare and adapt for. And, you know, frankly, I'm glad we have time to, to, to cross that bridge because it's, uh, there's, there's some things we need to learn about how the, the logistics will work and, and the fact that we were willing to be malleable as a league and, and, and how this was going to happen and not just stuff it in immediately is a, is a real positive outcome for me. Next question, Daniel Kramer. Jerry, uh, have you gotten to connect with Julio yet you know, over the past 24 hours? Uh, if so, what was that conversation like? And how eager are you to put eyes on him as he uh, comes into a very big spring training for him? Well, I, I, I've not yet spoken with him voice to voice. Uh, the last time I spoke with Julio was when we added him to our 40-man roster. Um, but the, I would say as, as we were finishing up on the, the phone call with MLB to, to let us know that this deal had been ratified. The, the first thing I received was, was a, uh, a short film <laughs> on, uh, on via text of Julio playing center field to, to let me know how it was going. So he, he looks great. He's in phenomenal shape. He's going to come in with high energy and his potential to impact sooner than later is, is extremely high. And, and I, and I love the person. So it's a, I'm, I'm really looking forward to, to seeing him. I know he is going to be, there's going to be a lot of hugs going around the, the locker room. And my guess is Julio is going to be in the middle of, a, of many of them. Next question, Corey Brock. Hey, Jerry, a quick two-parter here. Are you just as reticent today as you were in November and December in moving prospects? And I don't mean the top guys, but your five through 20. And then also... A guy on the roster I find fascinating, Luis Torrens. What's his path to the opening day roster? Uh, you know, I'll go in, in reverse. With LT, his his path is he's going to have to, to catch some. And, you know, in the second half last year, catching was just not part of the, the routine. We were integrating Cal Raleigh on a regular basis. So we really trust and believe in his upside. And it's irrefutable, the, the leadership value and, and what he does for our game plan with, that Tom Murphy brings to the table. So uh, it's going to be tough to balance, the, to find a way to, to timeshare with three catchers. I do feel like when we're facing left-hand pitchers, we don't have, you know, nine better hitters than Luis Torrens. So finding his way into the lineup against lefties is going to be easy. What we saw last year in the second half with LT was something that I think really intrigued all of us, just how hard he was hitting the ball, the, the, the refinement of his offensive approach when he came back from Tacoma and how he, he just wore out center field. He wore it out with power to the biggest part of the field, and he showed just a, a much cleaner, more mature approach in the box. Again, especially against the lefties. So there's a spot for LT on our roster, and we feel like he's going to be a contributor for us. We're going to have to be creative in how that looks defensively. 
Uh, he's played some first. He's played a little bit of third in, in more practice scenarios, and we'll continue to explore that like we will with so many of our players. Just the, the more versatile or flexible a player is positionally, just a better chance you have of getting your ABs. And that's what everybody wants is, is the chance to go hit four or five times. And, you know, as far as the, the reticence involved in you know, trading top of the, the, the system prospects, you know, we're, we're still in the same place we were with, you know, it, when you talk about guys like Julio or George Kirby or Noel A. Marte, there, there's, you know, you talk about guys like Levi Stout and Brandon Williamson. Well, you never say never. Uh, there's, it's, it is hard to imagine the scenarios where we would trade the guys at the very top of that list. And, you know, I, I can't imagine a scenario where we would move, you know, the Julio or, or George, but we just feel like those guys are, are on the doorstep to impact what we do. That being said, you know, with, with others in our system and we love our players, you have to give to get. And, and when you're talking about acquiring potential impact players, you're going to have to give, you know, potential impact prospects. So uh, we've certainly discussed it, but we're in no different a place than we were uh, entering the off season, which was the guys that are at the very top of our prospect lists are, are going to be really difficult for us to, to move. Next question, Rick Riz. Hey, Jerry, with uh, condensed spring, uh, has how much talk has there been about expanded rosters in April to, to help keep you healthy? You know, it's, it's on the table as a possibility, but it's not a certainty. And, you know, I, I know as a player coming out of spring training in 1995, we had those extra two roster spots for a period of time. You know, that was briefly discussed last night on a call with the league. I think we're going to discuss it through the course of the spring as to, you know, the real necessity there. And we really won't know until we, we watch where the players are when they come in. But, you know, the game is so much different now than it was even, you know, 25, 30 years ago. It, it is a 365, you know, day a year job for these players. And, and they are physically prepared. They're, they, they take care of their bodies in ways that generations before, you know, didn't or weren't able to. And, and you know, they come in ready to roll. Uh, they, they look like Adonis's the minute they walk through the door. And, you know, my guess is by Monday morning, they're going to look like they're ready to play because they've all been active and, and out there on the field and they'll be ready to go. I think we have time for three or four more questions. We'll start with Jen. Gary, with the universal DH, how does that change either the free agent market or the conversations that you're having with some of those guys? Because now, you know, you've got two leagues battling for sluggers. I think it's from an industry standpoint, this was a, it was a big thing for, for players who are primarily designated hitters. It created an avenue for them to either continue their careers you know, or, you know, establish one. And, you know, back when the DH was implemented, I think in 1973, it, it created, you know, whether it was the Frank Robinsons or the Harmon Killebrews, you know, the guys that were at the tail end of their careers, they were able to extend it. Perhaps we see that again with, with some of the great hitters of the last 10 or 15 years as, as they become, you know, full-time designated hitters in a 30-team league. And, you know, there's opportunity there. You know, I will say for us, it, it's not particularly relevant to what we're doing, we will use the designated hitter in much the same way we, we did last year, where it is a rotation among a variety of players that, that at various times may include Mitch Hanniger and Kyle Lewis and Ty France. And, and there's Abraham Toro, just finding the, the, the way to get players on the field and maximize the, their, their chances without overwhelming them with defensive reps. We found that to be a really positive thing. Uh, that that came out of our 2021 season, and we want to continue with that model. Next question, Larry Stone. Hey, Jerry. Uh, just a follow up on Julio. Does the fact that there's fewer spring training games impact his chance of making the team with, with just like a overwhelming performance, like you know Griffey had years ago that you've talked about in the past? Uh, you wouldn't put it past him to work his earn his way onto the team. Is that lessened to now? No, I don't think so. Uh, you know, actually probably makes it a little better because there's less time for us to, <laughs> to waffle, but he is, you know, Julio is such an exceptional young player and I know he's going to come in ready to go. Uh, I think in a lot of ways, he, 
he is intent on wowing us. And, and he always has, he, he's, he's, he knocks, yeah, we, we throw him pitches and he knocks him out of the park every time. And he's a wonderful kid. He's well-adjusted. He's incredibly talented. I think he's ready for the challenge on the big stage. The only two things really that, that will be debatable outside of his, his own performance this spring for us is going to be, you know, the experience that he's had above a ball. It's, it's, it's not a lot, but what it was either on the Olympic stage or in double a was purely dominant in ways that you just don't see uh, young players perform. So that is what I would call a very minor concern. And then the other is just what we do between now and opening day on the free agent or trade markets. And, you know, the, there are only so many roster spots to go around. And if we do add uh, and everybody stays healthy, then that becomes a roster management issue. But, you know, it's, it's not a matter of, of when Julio, or I guess if Julio impacts our team, it's a matter of when. And, and I feel the same coming into this spring as I did going into the off season. We don't want to put anybody in, 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 in a position to block Julio from ascending to the big leagues, but we, which is why we're focused in that area more on a left-handed hitter than, than a right is where we are interested in making sure that, that he gets his reps when it's his time. And, you know, if, if a left-handed hitter allows us to use the, the function of matchups with Hanny, with Kyle Lewis, with Kelnick, with, with Julio, it's, it's a, that's a pretty good problem to have. All right, Angie, next question. Jerry, you talked uh, a little bit ago about the value of uh, pitchers with flexibility. We heard you talk about having to ramp up on the pitch count. I I'm curious how the limit of how many times, you know, a player, and I'm specifically kind of talking more about a pitcher, can go down to the minors hinders things in regards to matchups and the kind of players you'll need? You know, I, I don't think that's a, that's an interesting, uh, I guess, addition to this CBA is the limit on the number of times you can option a player to the minor leagues. And I think last year, and frankly, in all the years that we've been here since, since 2016, I think last year with Wyatt Mills was the first time that we'd ever experienced uh, or trip that bar, so to speak. And, and, you know, we've generally had a pretty fluid roster, especially on the back end of the roster. So it's not a huge concern for us. I don't think it will hinder us in a meaningful way. It, it's also fair to say that whether it is someone like a Wyatt Mills or an Eric Swanson, or I, I could line up others, including some who've popped onto our radar here in our mini camp and now, you know, headed into minor league spring training, we do feel like, you know, that's an area where we're particularly strong and, and any number of players can step in and help out and including a variety of young starters who are going to have to go out and make a team, you know, guys like Justice Sheffield and Justin Dunn and Nick Margavichus. And there's, there's opportunity here, but there's also more depth than, than really we've had in this, the, the now going on seven years that we've been here. All right, last question, T. Hi, Oops, sorry. Hi, Jerry. Hi, T. Um, you said that uh, you need a left-hander, left-hitter than right-hander hitter. But uh, we, our Japanese fan, uh, had concern about Japanese right-hand outfielder so I, I don't know you can say or not, but uh, you have concern about that? We're, we're not, yeah, some guys are just good versus everybody. <laughs> and, the, <laughs> you know, when you, get to, when you get to that stage in the game and you're talking about, you know, high-level talents, there's a, you're probably not concerned with, with uh, the, the platoon matchups. So I, I'll, I'll leave it with that. There's... There are certain players that are available on this market that transcend whether they're right or left hand hitters, and you know we'll remain interested in players in, at that in that category. So you can say <laughs> exactly <laughs> Japanese or not. <laughs> yeah, I I like Japanese players. It's just like I like American and Dominican <laughs> and Venezuelan players out there. I like great players, and and uh, and we've you know we're certainly like I said at the start of the call, we were 
heavily engaged with a number of, of what we think are elite talents prior to the, the beginning of this lockout. And, and we will remain heavily engaged until we run it to ground because we do want to get better. And, you know, it's a, ideally we are adding two offensive players and minimally we would like one of them to be left-handed because that's how we feel we're going to maximize the opportunities, frankly, especially for Julio. Hey, Jerry, quickly before you go, do you, do you get the sense that the, these free agents or the teams that want to make trades want to get it done quickly because of the compressed nature or not? You know, I'm not really getting that, Ryan. It's uh, it's, it's been mostly a normal pace and you know, the, you know, last night into this morning, we have visited now with, I would say, pretty close to all 30 teams and reestablished where they are. Most teams are in a very similar position to where they were headed into December. We've reached out to try to reconnect with a lot of agents. But, you know, there are 30 teams doing what we're doing right now. So, you know, it's some combination of Justin and I, you know, reaching out and making these phone calls. And, you know, we've I think we've engaged with, you know, most or all of the players we were most interested in and, and we'll find out, you know, what the, the time frame is, but nobody seems to be in a crazy rush. Uh, that being said, I, I, it, it'd be, you know, hard for me to believe that the free agents on the market aren't chomping at the bit to get into a camp and, and start working with a team, but you know, how quickly that moves, I don't know. All right. Thanks, Jerry. We appreciate you joining us today. Thanks, Jerry. Thanks, guys. Arigato. All right. That's all we have today, everyone. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Thank you.